like to Oh, Bud, Bud's, yeah. yeah, he was in my company. Oh, was he? Yeah. Interesting. He, he was, uh, yeah, he was in, in, in the uh, weapons, weapons platoon. Nice guy. Yeah. Okay, we're rolling. Um, I wanted to ask you if you received a medal due to your action on 914. Yeah, you know, got the, uh, I think the whole squad uh, got the brown star. Did you ever read, what was the write-up on your citation? It was, uh, I forgot where, where it is. Well, it tells about what, what one did. But the thing that surprised me, it was, uh, it was meritorious rather than, uh, you know, you get, get two. I mean, there, you get a, a, a bronze star for heroic action, you get a bronze star for meritorious. And I know that Ken McDonald, I read his, was meritorious and it should have been heroic. And, you know, I don't know how they make the distinction there, but it depends, I think, who writes it up and all that sort of stuff. But you were side by side. What? But you were side by side. Uh, you mean Ken and I? Yeah. Uh, but not, not on Belvedere, okay? I, well, we were literally side by side, but I mean, he was in, you know, in a different platoon. And because uh, he had different uh, objective on on Belvedere, and uh, so that that sort of surprised me, and and the other guys, you know, because you think of meritorious as being, you know, did something good. <laughs> You're mean getting a merit, and. Uh, well, I'd, I still don't know why, 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 why it was that way, but anyway, it was. How do you think your training and battle experiences helped the men stick together? Well, you have this comradeship, friendship, but comradeship, you know, you're, you're not you don't think that you're defending the Constitution or the flag or anything like that. That's a bunch of horse ticky. But you're there, when you're there in combat, you're there, you're, you're protecting your friend, your comrade. So you're always thinking about, about the other guy. But also you're thinking about yourself because you're scared. And, but this keeps you together, you know, because you you sleep together, you suffer together, uh, you endure shelling fire together, and uh, so that, that brings you close together. And I, you know, I think of Hoyles Kennedy, I think of, uh, of Val Appel, uh, and these guys in my, my company, and um, but then the, some of the others, I think, that's kept us together, really, is the love of the out of doors. And so I think the crucible of combat probably uh, make, cements a relationship even more, uh, more so. Could you have imagined that 60 years later, the 10th Mountain Division would have such a significant role in your life? No, I had no idea. I really didn't. And I can remember sitting on the hillside before Hill 913 with Bob Woody, my college roommate, to become my college roommate. And we were talking about if we, if we survived and we were planning to go to Dartmouth, that, look, we're not going to bother with fraternities and all this sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, we had all these great ideals that sort of crumbled when we got back to college. Uh, our third roommate was Charlie Carpenter, the great skier, but he also was handsome. And uh, I'll never forget that the, uh, we, we had a, a, a mail slot in the door. And in come the invitations to the fraternities. Carpenter, Eldridge, Carpenter, Carpenter, Woody, Eldridge, Carpenter, Carpenter, and 
Charlie, I think, was uh, was solicited or, or, or approached by all practically all the fraternities. And here Bob and I had maybe four or five invitations apiece. And then we would go to Charlie, uh, go to, you know, to visit the fraternities. And Christ, oh, they'd say, oh, Charlie, great to see you. And uh, Bob and I felt like we were wallflowers. <laughs> oh, God. So we lost our resolve, you know. Here we were. We weren't going to join a fraternity. I just remember that so well. And so we went with the flow and we joined a, a fraternity and uh, didn't amount to a hill of beans, you know. Really, I didn't spend much time at the fraternity. But... When you think about the ideals that crumbled, what, what were those ideals? Well, I mean, well, like the fraternity. I mean, that ideal, yeah. And in a way, you know, we, we were stunted in, in our, our growth. We missed the uh, going to college as 18-year-olds. Uh, so here we are, 21, 22-year-olds. And so we're wrestling with, you know, well, I... You know, I, I like to be in college, but and they had traditions, you know, like wearing your damn beanie and stuff like that, which we did not like to do or anything, so we didn't do a lot of the things, you know, that were childish to us. But on the other hand, we felt that, yeah, we missed something, you know, during those three or four years. And, uh, and you find out maybe you're not as mature as you thought you might, that you were. And... Because uh, you think in some ways you were very mature? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were ways we were very mature. But on the other hand, we were immature in other ways. And uh, I think it's sort of an individual thing. Did but, you think at some points during especially heavy action that you might not survive? Oh. Often, you often feel that, that you're not going to make it. And the more casualties there are in your, in your company, and then you see your f friends that are being killed. And I knew, Wales and I were, were uh, in the um, foxhole together, right? You know, behind the lines. I forgot you. Well, there's a trench, actually, we were sleeping in it. And I knew, I said, I felt that I definitely was going to get hit, you know, on 913. Just had the feeling. So didn't he. And I talked, and then I talked to Bob, and we didn't know if we'd ever see each other again because he was in C Company. So we sort of bid each other farewell, and that was it. So there was a sense that, uh, that I wasn't going to make it. I knew that I, I was going to get hit. I had that feeling. And sure enough, I did. And so did Wales Kennedy. We've recreated this thing, and he, I think we, he got hit by the same fragments of the same mortar that I got. But he was able to go on, on uh, further. And what is it that pulled you through in those difficult moments? You mean of... When you're thinking that you won't be oh, surviving. Uh, well, like, when, once you're in action, you, you don't think about that. Uh, you got a job to do. You're scared. And so you keep doing what you're supposed to do, you know. So you don't, you don't think of, or at least I didn't, and I think a lot of guys, because you're you're doing things, you're, but you're scared, you're you're frightened, and but you say, oh, you got you got to do your job. I say, I like to get the hell out of here. How do I get out of here? And but you say, I can't leave my friends, you know. And uh, so you just keep plodding away, and I think that's what what does it. Did you have a sense that you were making history at the time? No, had no idea. I just figured, I knew that the war in Italy had gone on for a year and a half, 
here were these troops, I mean, here was the 34th, the 36th Infantry Division, the 3rd Infantry Division. Here were the Canadians that they've been fighting for far longer than we had. And so I didn't feel that we, uh, I mean, we're, we're doing anything more significant than the others. I knew about Anzio, knew about uh, Casino and all those, and I just thank God that I was never there. But I'd see these troops and knew that, you know, you'd see the, uh, their decorations when you're back in Florence and knew these guys were really, had been through it. Did you have a sense that the 10th Mountain was special? Oh, I also had a, a sense that we were special, but because I know that the, back in Florence and some of these places that the other infantry divisions guys would like to, they say, let's see how blue your blood is and, and get, get in some fist fights. Well, those are the, I, I avoided those, but it was the damn Yank magazine that wrote up the story about you know, the Blue Bloods. I mean, it was a little overdone. You know, the college kids and all that sort of stuff. So that was just made great uh, 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 food for all the combat infantry guys. Well, who are these guys in the tent think they are? But let's see how blue their blood is. <laughs> how blue was it? Well, they didn't, didn't find mine, I'll tell you. <laughs> I have, learned. <laughs> do you have a sense that they're special today? Yes, I have a special in the sense of maybe what we've done more in peace than in war. I and the uniqueness of the the love of the outdoors, the skiing, the the climbing. That's what's kept us together. Uh, the the war. I think, I think a lot of us get embarrassed about all the, you know, the glory that the 10th gets today, which is, to me, highly undeserved. And it was only because we were the ski troops. We were un unique in that way. But uh, combat, I, I think of the, the 422nd uh, Combat Regimental Team, the Nisi outfit, Japanese Americans, some who were in those uh, incarceration camps that came, that, prob that unit was the highly, most highly decorated unit of World War II. And they were great soldiers. And there were so many divisions you know, all over that did far, had far more combat experience, did far more than the 10th. So the glory that we get really is undeserved in my view. And, uh, and I always want, if I'm talking, I always want to put it in perspective that we were the last division there, the first to go back. And so there are, and as, I think Ken McDonald. Have you written? Have you read his combat history of L Company? I'll get you a copy, and maybe I ought to interview Ken. Brilliant lawyer, and highly recognized as a civil rights lawyer. Well, at any rate, uh, I lost my train of thought. Well, you were the first, the last in, the first out, um, and so the greater glory belongs to others, but do you have the sense that what you did was different than what others did? Uh, not, not really different. I mean, we we're doing our job. We were, we used the skills that we had, but when you think of what the other divisions had done and been through, you know, they suffered far greater than we did, fought far longer. And I think you have to put this in perspective. And uh, so I'm sure if there was an organization called the Association 
of the U.S. Fifth Army, we'd be the first guys they'd kick out. <laughs> you say that with all humility. <laughs> you like to be first, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell first me how you, how you think that the current 10th Mountain Light carries on the legacy of the old timer 10th in spirit? Uh, I think at the individual level, and, and particularly from the enlisted men, there's a much more spirit there. I think that the officers at this stage of the game, certainly the high-ranking officers, they're really not interested in joining the 10th Mountain Association in my conversations with Pat Muir and others because there are other more prestigious organizations to join, like the Association of the United States Army. And, and that's where the officers, you know, sort of shine. Uh, but I think that those enlisted men that I've met have have the spirit, and uh, oh, and certainly Plummer, you know, who's the secretary. He he's he's a good man, but I think you you've got to get to the point where you're retired or out of active service where you can really get involved. Well, would you think that the uh, current 10th Mountain Light carries on the legacy? Yes. No, I think they're very proud of the legacy. There's no question about that. And, uh, and I think that's great. What qualities do you think they have that you guys had? Well, one is is, is commitment. I understand, and I don't know this for a fact, that that a lot of a lot of soldiers want to be part of the Tenth Mountain Division because they feel that the Tenth Mountain is one of the best infantry divisions in, in the United States Army. And I guess the, well, you know more about it than I do, and uh, so. And that's great, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, at, at first I didn't quite relate to the, you know, the new 10th, because you meet the high mucky mucks, you know, and you don't meet the real soldiers. And when you meet the real soldiers and find out how they feel, this is, this is great. But I think that also we can't forget the Mountain Warfare, the Vermont National Guard Mountain Warfare School and the 172nd Mountain Battalion. Now they, these are real mountain soldiers. They, and many of them are Hamanian climbers in the Warfare School. Many of them are uh, oh, the guys who, uh, you know, biathlon team. And so we've had an opportunity to meet some of these people through the SISMs, which is the uh, World Military Ski Championships. And, and that is really a great event. And Vermont has hosted it, I think, on three times. And the International Federation of Mountain Soldiers awards a, a trophy to the best, and to the winning team of the four-man uh, ski patrol race, which is like a biathlon but it's a team race with four. And it's fantastic to see. And the first team, the first year that we presented this, gosh, I don't know how many years ago that was, uh, it was the German team that won. And so it's a beautiful Revere Bowl. And then each team member gets a individual trophy. And so the trophy, is a rotating trophy and it goes to the different teams, you know, the winning teams. And so each country, wherever it's going to be hosted, if it's going to be in Austria, then it would be the Austrian delegation, the IFMS. And, and I've forgotten who, the cup, I mean the bowl, 
disappeared when it, when it went to Russia, but finally someone got it. And, uh, but that is fascinating to be at the SISM's race to see all these, how many, 25 countries or something like this? I mean, men and women who are racing downhill, uh, slalom who are doing cross country and, and the biathlon, and a wonderful relationship with the, uh, you know, among the countries and, and skiing primarily. Do you see any parallels between the way the 10th Mountain Light and the Vermont Winter Warfare soldiers are now and the way you were then? I'm sorry, I didn't. Do you see any parallels between the way you were during World War II as a 10th Mountain soldier and the way the 10th Light and the Winter Warfare the soldiers now? Uh, yeah. Parallels? Uh, what do you have in common with uh, Okay, them? yes. Well, there certainly is a, is a parallel probably more with the Mountain Warfare School in the 172nd, because I know them a little more intimately and know of their winter skills and their climbing skills. And this is a very, very close parallel. Whereas the tent certainly has got our spirit, but, uh, and we all realize that they have, uh, you know, different missions. I mean, jungle warfare, desert warfare, uh, urban warfare, and mountain and cold weather. But I don't know how much mountain and cold weather they get. And, and I do know that, the, I, as I understand it, the cadre in the 10th excuse me, is um, trained by the Vermont National Guard Mountain Warfare School. And uh, and I know when we went to climb Riva Ridge, uh, we had, I think there were about a dozen uh, 10th Mountain men, two from the Mountain Warfare School. And of that, I would say there were three or four who were really mountaineers. The others were not, but they were good soldiers. And there's only one that's kept in contact and he keeps in contact with Dick Wilson. And he's Colonel, I can't think of his name right now, Smith. But his uncle was in the 10th Mountain Division. But, oh, Gene Smith is his name, Colonel Gene Smith. And his wife, they're both great rock climbers. And they do it recreationally. But he was, a, you know, he was good and he was a very, helpful in uh, on Riva Ridge and the other two were uh, from the Mountain Warfare School so it was Bob Parker and I and these guys that went out and laid laid the ropes uh, uh, along with some Alpini and the Mountain Rescue Group local group. When you look back what does it mean to you to be 10th Mountain? It means uh, I think I have a, more friends and close acquaintances in the tenth than I do, say, among my college friends, because we shared a rather unique experience, and we volunteered. Again, it comes back to the love of the mountains and the skiing and the climbing, the hiking. And, and that's what makes it so, so unique. Little did I know that I would be so involved in, you know, in this war outfit of mine, but it's, it's a lot of fun. My wife has, uh, you know, wonderful friends from, from the 10th. And so over the years, I think we've had a, clo a closer relationship with the tenth, than either one of our colleges. Well, we got some wonderful friends there, and we travel with them. But the tenth is unique from that standpoint. What are the core values of the tenth?
Interesting question. Core values. I don't know. You know, that's a... You know, other than sort of repeating myself. Well, how about, let me phrase it this way. If you had to sum up what the spirit of the tenth was, what would the spirit of the tenth be? You know, it's interesting. If you were going to sum it up for somebody who didn't know the tenth at all. Yeah. And they said, well, what are your... What's... Oh, well, again, I would say it's the outer doors. The... The love of the outer door is the love of being able to share the experience with, with other people, in which we shared so much in the tenth, and which we've shared for many years afterwards. The, what kind of people are the tenth people? They're great people. And they're fun to be with. And and generally speaking, you know. Wherever you go, if you run into a situation at a hotel, if you're in a, on a reunion, the tenth people go with the flow, by and large. And uh, what you don't find in, say, maybe your your your, your college friends, or or if you're on a trip with them, they they expect more perks. Yeah. No. But it's. I'd say just great people. Is tenth, Fun. An, is tenth an attitude? Huh. Or if tenth was an attitude, what would the attitude be? Oh, if the tenth were an attitude, the attitude would be let, let's save the planet, let's save the environment. Uh, I think that would be the attitude. Let's do something, uh, you know, for humanity. I think of the guys who, oh, there was this fellow, uh, uh, Bob Lewis, who created this nature trail for the blind, 10th Mountain guy. Uh, I think of other people uh, who've done things for others. I think of the guy Winther, Winther, who was the fellow that formed the handicap scheme. He was the, the father of that movement, and he was a tenth guy. So I think, you know, you, you, you go back and you think of a lot of these people. Oh, uh, trying to th uh, Bauer. Oh, Dave Brower. Huh? Dave Brower. Dave Brower. He's the man who saved the Grand Canyon. And I think of Johnny Rand, who was, uh, I think, Sergeant Major of the 87th. Johnny Rand was the uh, director of the Dartmouth Outing Club and a highly respected guy. As a matter of fact, all the guys who, tenth, or Dartmouth guys who became officers would go over and ask Ran, what do I do? <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, so I, I think, you know, the 10th the has contributed a lot to the outer doors, to obviously the ski movement, to the mountaineering, to the environment, and, uh, you know, I can't think of all the, all the aspects of it, but there are a number of guys out there that are involved in some way or other in uh, saving the environment, saving the planet, saving the wilderness. The wilderness that we knew 60 years ago that seems to be fast disappearing. I know that I'm one of the people I'm against the expansion of Mount, Mount Sunapee. They want to make it like Vale or something like that. They're going to get, want the state to um, lease them or give them a corridor to their land on the west side of the mountain where they're going to put up all these condominiums. As, and that's a state park. 
it's going to, you know, destroy it. It's going to take the values away of what makes Sonope Sonope. And uh, it's I interesting, it's ironic that the tenth starts where, where the major factor in the growth of skiing and all aspects. Now today, you look at what was created and you've created a, a monster. Uh, it's no longer the great skiing areas. It's the, the condos, the real estate development. And the people who ski today at, at say, at, at Vail or Aspen or wherever, and, you know, they're the multimillionaires. They're the ones that have all the money to spend. And they ski about an hour a day. And the rest of the day is, you know, they're eating or drinking or socializing or shopping. And I was astounded when Hugh and I were at Aspen last year. They're selling fur coats. Real, you know, real animal fur coats. And I thought that was verboten. And, uh, and here it is in the heart of the skiing area. How th things have changed. You wouldn't be caught in one of those, would you? <laughs> no. How do you think being in war with the ten shapes, shaped your attitude about peace? Yes, definitely. How? 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 I've been very much against war. And I think most people who have been in combat do not want to see their children or anyone else have to go through war. And I think of the things that, you know, like the, uh, through the International Federation of Mountain Soldiers forming these peace trails, for taking these battle areas and making them for peace. And I would say that most uh, of the 10th guys, and certainly uh, were, were for, for peace against war. And I know that when my own son, he was Vietnam age, and I was gonna advise him if he was called up to go to Canada. And uh, because I, had a, I have a nephew who was wounded in Vietnam, both physically and mentally. And uh, a brilliant kid who's a what, plumber or something. I mean, nothing wrong with being a plumber, but he's doing sort of uh, work for his, uh, a f his parents' friends down in Puerto Rico. And here's a guy that would have made a fantastic, he was just a brilliant mathematician and engineer, and this is the war has done to him. And I think, you know, being repeated over and over again. How did it shape you? How did it shape me? Well, it made me realize that I really had a civic duty to, to do things, and I, uh, well, in 62, I was one of the founding members of the New Hampshire uh, Civil Liberties Union. And uh, I must say, a lot of people misunderstand what the hell it's all about. It's protecting our rights, the Bill of Rights. And, but at any rate, I think that had something to do with it. I don't know. Do you think the war shaped you in any negative way? I mean, I know you're not a plumber in Puerto Rico working for your parents' friends. No, no. Oh. Well, I think war sometimes has a, a uh, you know, a negative impact. Uh, well, I remember early on, and I think this is common for most people who, uh, when I got married, I still was suffering with, you know, nightmares and scared. And 
that's not too good to bring to your your wife or so there's some negative aspects about that you carry over and uh, anybody who goes through a traumatic experience whether it's war or you can have an automobile accident or burn uh, or you know there's the trauma and I you know I think of Debbie Gamar and you know what she went through in that terrible automobile accident the burn can you think of anything else we might have missed that later on you'll say, boy, I wish I had said X, Y, Z? Uh, no. I can't think of anything. Bill, anything I missed? No. <laughs> you know, uh, just one thing. I, I, I think uh, uh, out of the 10th experience, you know, to... Uh, Fritz Benedict, I think about the, the the Tenth Mountain hut system, and you know, and how many people are doing that today? That became out of the tenth. I think of the uh, foundation, the the scholarship programs. I mean these outreach programs. I think of the IFMS, and so I think the tenth. We've done. Uh, a lot of, a lot of good, had a lot of fun, and I guess that sort of sums it up. Maybe you can't <laughs> okay. wind it up, Bill. Mm -hmm. Pack it. <laughs>